people. It's Sleep, aka you're gonna finally hear my government, Eric Coleman, coming to you okay. live from Philly Camp. Oh, like Sports enthusiasm. Okay. Are you enthused? <laughs> what? Just six o'clock. Oh, okay. Channel six. We're now at party, and we're now supposed we're to. Out of rent. We're out of rent. Now we're just talking Hi, because they sort of blending the They're trying to figure out the how the right. We are on Philly Camp. The most mm -hmm. fun okay. you can have with your clothes on. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> on Raise 103.9 FM so and 4 minutes to start. Three minutes. And I want you to check out our okay. show, The Hype, every Thursday night at 6 o'clock right here. And we're not talking at all. Yo, this no, is the boy right here. I know. It's like, my show is a lot. You know it's very goofy. Right so now. it's like, I'm not even to the number one really station on Earth. I know, right? And I always say, every time I type a letter to Philly Cam, I always say at the end, Philly Cam rock on forever. Stay tuned. in celebration of Philly Cam's fourth anniversary. Our focus tonight is healthcare, certainly a hot button issue in so many ways, and my guests are all involved with local groups that provide services and information all related to healthcare. With us is Athena Ford, Karen Hunt, and Angela Kapalko. Let's start with Athena. Hi, thank you for having me today. Great. As you mentioned, my name's Athena. How long have you been in uh, in operation? SPAN got its start in 2007, where we originally were working to expand healthcare access at the state level. And then as soon as we saw healthcare reform coming around the bend, we immediately recognized that it was being tremendously beneficial to Pennsylvania. So we began to support it. Since the laws been passed, we've been engaged in a lot of education around it. Quite a bit of misinformation about what's in the healthcare law. So we were working to set the record straight. We're seen as a trusted source of information by both Republicans and Democrats, so that's helpful in our work. And then we also work to advocate to make sure that it's implemented in a way that works best for Pennsylvania consumers. How do you get the word out? 
Well, we run a policy call series, we run webinars, we do live trainings. We encourage folks to sign up for our email list to hear about that stuff. Um, we also work on a lot of, we'll do a lot of rallies, a lot of media events, try to get out into the newspaper, into the cameras, and we um, will also do quite a bit of phone in days and lobby days in Harrisburg to make sure that our legislators are getting the word, that they're hearing from Pennsylvanians and they're hearing the voice of consumers whose lives and whose health is at stake. And we also just go out into communities, talk to people, come on terrific shows like this one. Whatever we can do to get the word out, we do. So now there's a deadline, is there not? People are supposed to take a look at their health care options and get everything together by January, is that right? So what's happening right now is the new health insurance marketplaces open up. For most Pennsylvanians, this isn't going to really affect them. But for people who are uninsured, people who buy their own health insurance and pay probably too much for it in the private marketplace, Folks who are getting their health insurance from their employer but shelling out quite a bit of their paycheck to do it, making more than 9.5% of their paycheck goes to that. Those individuals, if they choose to, can purchase health insurance through this new marketplace. It's already opened up. They would go to healthcare.gov to do that. There is a deadline. You're right. And the deadline is March 31st. Open enrollment closes. But you want to sign up by December 15th so that your coverage takes effect January 1st because that's when the new health insurance will kick in. Great. Great. Karen? Um, yes, I'm, I'm Karen Hunt. I am president-elect of uh, Pennsylvania National Organization for Women. Um, now has been around since 1966. Uh, we work at every, in parallel with every level of government. So we have um, local chapters, state chapters, and also operate at the national level. We are a multi-issue feminist organization and we are driven by six core missions, economic justice, reproductive justice, lesbian rights or um, gender equality, combating racism, ending violence against women, and constitutional equality, which means we support um, you know, an equal rights amendment to the Constitution. Great, so I'm sure the Affordable Care Act has is a huge, brings huge benefits uh, for women. I mean, by design, it decouples um, health insurance from your employment situation and also, of course, you know, makes insurance more affordable. So that's a huge benefit for women. Um, you know, uh, almost two thirds of low income workers are women. Women are more likely to be, you know, part time employed or uh, work in, uh, you know, be self-employed or work in small business situations where benefits aren't offered. So um, just, you know, the ACA design is, is going to benefit women immensely. And then of course there's, you know, the contraception, and, you know, having preventive uh, care, reproductive care covered by insurance is of course going to be a huge benefit um, for women too. Uh, contraception, you know, women are, fertile for 30 years, you know, on average, um, and most families say they want two children, so contraception's going to do a lot of the heavy lifting there. Um, right. Contraception costs, you know, costs uh, on average $50 a month, so, so it's really going to be very helpful and beneficial for women. Great. Angela, you're a clinician. Thank you for having, uh, having me here. This is fantastic that I get to talk about the amazing organization that I work for, um, Philadelphia Fight. Um, I am one of the physician assistants at the Jonathan Lacks Treatment Center, which is the clinic uh, inside of Philadelphia Fight. Fight was started, which stands for Field Initiating Groups for HIV Trials. We originally started um, to get HIV medication to patients that needed it um, back in the late 80s and 90s. And from there, it was decided that not only do we need to get medication, but we need to have clinicians there. So we have developed into this large organization um, that takes care of HIV positive patients in a clinic with case managers on site, with mental health on site, uh, with research on site. We also have uh, our youth health empowerment program for our high risk youth. We also have 
um, community justice for our high-risk ex-offenders and um, uh, former prisoners coming out of jail. So it's a great organization to, to give information to people about HIV and people who are HIV positive to give them information about themselves and, and what's going on with their health. And, and I get to be a part of that, which is fantastic. So I am one of the clinicians as well as the, the research coordinator. So I get to play with all of the new medications and trials and get to see how they work and, and they're working great. So certainly, uh, the management of that condition, that's changed in the past you know, decade. I mean, it's a, it's a whole different scenario now. It is a whole different scenario. It is significantly powerful that I get to tell a patient who walks in today, who is newly diagnosed, you're going to live. Amazing. And it's going to be okay. And, and you have so many options and I am going to be with you for years to come and I'm going to be bothering you about your smoking <laughs> and not about your HIV because this is a chronic medical condition, just like hypertension, just like diabetes, and it is manageable and, and let's do this together. And I, and I enjoy doing that now and I'm, I'm actually very fortunate that I'm a clinician now and I, I love talking to the clinicians who, who worked in the time when it was, it was very difficult because there, there wasn't a lot of medication. I can learn a lot from them, um, but it's great now just to kind of tell patients that's where it was and this is where we are now. That's great. Where is your center located? So we are located on um, the corner of 13th and Locust um, in Center City, Philadelphia. We um, used to be just on the fifth floor of the building. We are now on the entire fifth floor most of the third floor, half of the second floor, the first floor, and we have two satellite sites um, for our youth group um, over on 15th and Locust and our uh, community justice center, which is up on uh, 12th and Market. Wow, that's amazing. I'm, I know also that you, you are also the, uh, is, would you say the curator of the AIDS library or the? So Philadelphia Fight is, uh, that it, so the uh, AIDS library is on our second floor, which is the largest AIDS um, library in the country where all information about HIV is, is housed and, and curated. And we have librarians that are there to help patients with that. We also have a great um, uh, a media access and computer services and for patients to get information and get access to, to information in their care. It's amazing, I mean, the, you know, the disease has changed so much. I mean, it, it's, it's now something that, like you said, can be managed as a chronic condition. And it's very interesting that you don't just treat the disease, you treat the whole person. Correct. Right, so it's definitely turned into much more of a holistic you know, care scenario. And we're also very unique in that we are an outpatient setting that is a primary care for our patients. So not only do we do their HIV care, but we also take care of their diabetes, their blood pressure, their, their female GYN and care as well. So, so we take care of it all for them in, in one place. We, as we call it, a one-stop shop. Really it's impressive. It's amazing. I mean, I'm sure National Organization of Women, you know, which is so uh, concerned about, you know, healthcare for women all across the board, you know, that's certainly very good news. I, in, you know, and, it's and amazing. It's amazing what you do. I mean, I, it, I mean, it is amazing. It is that you were telling us a story about uh, an OBGYN you had that, you know, takes personal care, you know, of, of uh, your HIV pregnant pregnant, pregnant women. women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, a, a high level of care. And, you know, that's, that's individuals. I mean, you know, you can, you can, you can have the ACA, but, but having dedicated professionals is really, I mean, that's the heart and soul of, of what you do. Uh, and it's it's very laudable. Um, certainly, both National Organization of Women and Philadelphia Fight have an interest in coverage for same-sex couples. Um, Athena, uh, you know, while Pennsylvania doesn't um, doesn't recognize same-sex marriage, does the Affordable Care Act, as you see it right now, does it have provision for such couples? So the Affordable Care Act does a lot of things for LGBT people. One is, according to a recent survey that was conducted by the Center for American Progress, about one in three LGBT people are uninsured. I'm sure folks are familiar, a common problem 
for example, is that one partner can get health insurance through their employer, but then the other partner can't be put on family coverage. So now the majority of these folks will have the opportunity to go into the health insurance marketplace and get coverage there. It's unfortunate that Pennsylvania hasn't yet moved forward with the Medicaid expansion, which is a whole other issue, but we are still left now in Pennsylvania with a gap of folks that are not going to get coverage, which wouldn't exist if our governor and our lawmakers would move forward with this piece. In the meantime, though, there's a couple other things the law does for LGBT folks. One is that starting January 1st, 2014, insurance companies are no longer allowed to discriminate against you because you have a pre-existing condition. That means they can't deny you coverage, they can't charge you higher, and they can't say, for example, oh, we'll cover everything except your bad heart. All of that is now illegal. The reason why this is relevant is because, believe it or not, being transgender is something that insurance companies used to say was a pre-existing condition and is why we can't give you coverage. So that's illegal. Also, discriminating in the health insurance marketplace any plan that wants to sell in the health insurance marketplace is not allowed to discriminate against people based on their gender identity or their sexual orientation. Well, the pre-existing condition uh, factor certainly was a, a very big issue with women. Oh, absolutely. In this state, in the state of Pennsylvania, and until the ACA takes effect, um, pregnancy is considered a pre-existing condition. So. You know, and, and uh, maternity care is not um, mandated in this state. It will be under the Affordable Care Act. But um, the truth is you could be a, you know, you could be employed, you could be insured and become pregnant and be out of luck. <laughs> you know, you, you could be in this state of, of Pennsylvania and in other states as well. So the Affordable Care Act is definitely a, a long stride in, in the right direction as, as far as um, all sorts of reproductive health care for women, including um, maternity care, certainly, uh, but also SDI, um, you know, screening, cancer screenings, mammograms. Um, it, it's it's going to be incredibly beneficial for um, prenatal care and for um, raising, you know, our rates of infant mortality, which are really dismal in Pennsylvania. So it's, it's a win-win a for women. Right. And certainly, with HIV being a pre-existing condition, your, you know, your patients can no longer be discriminated for health care either. Definitely. And, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out how the ACA is going to work for our patients with the other insurances that are out there. Now, there are coverages and um, you know, government-funded coverages, but we're hoping that this will help a significant amount of patients um, get better access to care and be able to go to some of those, those preventative health care services that they weren't able to go to. I have many patients that that work and, and were able to get them access to their medication through a special pharmaceutical benefit program, which is fantastic. I can get them their medication and I can get them their lab work, but I can't get them a mammogram and I can't send them to the cardiologist and, and all of those things that we're hoping that that'll help with them because those patients who, who work and, and are in society can get all those other services that they haven't been able to get. It's true. Um, now, Karen, do you think that the inclusion of uh, female contraception into the ACA um, will have a positive effect on pro-choice? Well, it, it, it should. It certainly should. Um, you know, uh, it's common sense and, and common knowledge tells you that uh, you know, increasing access to contraception is going to drive the rate of unintended pregnancy down mm -hmm. and therefore will drive the rate of abortion down. So you would think that everyone on all sides of this issue could get behind uh, expanding you know, ac access to contraception, but unfortunately that is not the case. Um, a very vocal minority um, opposes contraception and um, fortu unfortunately they're very well represented in Congress. Um, in fact, in, over the shutdown, they, one of the, the bills, you know, one of the last minute bills that the House sent to, to the Senate stripped um, contraceptive care from the Affordable Care Act. It was, a, you know, non-starter in the Senate, thank goodness, but I mean, it's, it's just a, a, a ridiculous stance to have uh, on, on contraception, so. Right. Um, well, the fight goes on. Yes. Right. And speaking of fight, you were telling us a very interestingly, Angela, about um, 
uh, HIV-infected mothers giving birth to babies, but you were able to intervene. So, so recently there was a case that did come out um, at one of the uh, conferences where there was a child that was born to an HIV positive mother um, who was not on medication. And the doctor at the time decided instead of giving uh, the, a single medication to the newborn, which is normally what is given as preventative uh, treatment for that newborn who, who is born, they decided to give a full cocktail of medications, three active medications that's normally given to someone who actually has a confirmed diagnosis of HIV. Chil infants are, are really difficult to diagnose right when they're born because they have antibodies from the mother and we're not, it's a little bit more difficult to decide. So the doctor very proactively decided to give this infant three active medications um, and, and see what happened. And the presentation came out that this child was given medication for a period of, of months and then was lost to care for about 18 months. And when came back into care, everyone was worried that this child might have HIV, started doing all this testing to find out that it wasn't there. And so we have always thought that if we treat someone very early, very early in their infection, not when they're diagnosed, but when they're actually infected, we might be able to, to eradicate it. And, and, you know, obviously it's, it's, we can't prove it, but this is one step in that, in that proof. So, so we're working in that way. And obviously this is going to be studied for, for many years. And this, you know, poor child, but good child is, is going to be looked at for, for a very long time. But that's our hope. Right there is our hope. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's just incredible because, you know, AIDS and HIV have sort of, you know, sometimes they don't get the media attention these days that they did, you know, say 15, 20 years ago. But so many amazing things are happening now that really deserve, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, this is, this is, you know, just incredible research that's going on and so much of it here in Philadelphia. Well, and, and specifically, um, not just people with HIV, but people that are at risk for HIV. Uh, one of the HIV or two of the HIV medications were actually approved for preventative uh, treatment for HIV, we call PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. So it was it was designed for people that were at high risk for getting infected. And a study came out that said if it was taken every single day, your risk of getting infection dropped by 84%. Wow. Now, when they actually looked at everybody that that did that, that 80, that, or sorry, 94%, that 94% were the people who actually took the medication. It dropped drastically for people who didn't take the medication or didn't take it enough. So we at Philadelphia Fight with our Youth Health Empowerment Program, YHEP, actually have a PrEP program. So we have developed this program for high-risk youth um, that to get access to this medication uh, called Truvada. Uh, free of charge. They come in for support for group and they get their medication on a weekly basis and a lot of counseling around it and it has been fantastic. Uh, they actually are bringing their own uh, their own friends in and, and their group in. You know, I, th I was the first one to actually say that I don't know how this is going to work. I don't know how we're going to get this out and our one clinician said no it's going to work. And she came back saying that the kids were actually standing up and saying, we can change the fate. We can change our fate. And, and we can, you know, they, for so long, some of these young, chil these young kids just thought that that's what I was going, that's what was going to happen to me. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm gay and that's what happens. I'm going to get HIV. So it was just, it was going to happen. And they're actually able to change their fate. And it's been fantastic watching these kids kind of blossom and, and they know that, that it's out there, that, that they're going to be okay. It gives them power. It does give them power, which is fantastic because they're... They, they're not victims. They're proactive. Yes. They, they are in control of their own lives. And we love that. It's awesome. Yeah. That's, that's, that is really amazing. Um, have, uh, have you noticed in your, in your education efforts um, that people are more receptive to education or, or 
less so than they were in the past? I mean, you know, are, are you know, do you run seminars? Are they attended? What, what what's the? We do. Um, we we. I mean, we've been running seminars ever since we started for a very long time, and, and we actually um, put on the. Uh, AIDS Education Month, which is the entire month of June that happens at the convention center, multiple different uh, conventions. Uh, we have the Prevention Summit, which is lots of lectures geared toward everyone to learn about HIV. And, and we've been growing significantly, significantly. We recently, uh, within the past couple of years now, have a faith group. So ministers and pastors and getting out to the churches and discussing, discussing this with, with people to get out to these groups because you know, we, we can talk a lot. Clinicians who do HIV can talk, but we treat people with HIV. How are we gonna get to the people that are negative or that don't know their status and that are afraid of, of getting tested? So we start discussing this with people throughout the community to try and get them together. And we found that you know, faith leaders are, are huge, are huge with their congregation um, to, to get it out there. So we've been working very hard with them. And, you know, all throughout the year, we go and do education projects and, and teachings, and we're hoping to just do more and more. That's great. That's great. Back to the Affordable Care Act and sort of how it re relates to everyone. What, with what you know of it now, mm -hmm. do there seem to be any glaring omissions, things that we really need to, you know, we need to say to the legislators, hey, you know, this really needs to be fixed? Yeah, I think the biggest issue is not with the Affordable Care Act, it's not with the law itself. So what happened was the law was written and it included, for people making between 100 and 400 percent of the federal poverty line, which 100% for an individual is around 11,000 some dollars a year and for a family of four it's around 23 some thousand dollars a year. So if you make between that and 400%, which is about $45,000 a year for an individual or $92,000 a year for a family of four, if you fall in between this gap, then you can get a tax credit to help you purchase that health insurance we were talking about right. before in the private marketplace. Mm -hmm. You go in there and you get the tax credit so that the health insurance package you pick out, which by the way, is the same health insurance package members of Congress are gonna have starting in 2014. This way, when you go in there to get your insurance, it's affordable, it's based on your income. Everybody making less than 138% of the federal poverty line, about $15,000 a year for an individual, those folks were supposed to go into Medicaid, expanded Medicaid, and this was huge. This was revolutionary because right now there's a big misconception that if you're low income you can get access to Medicaid and that's simply not true. In Pennsylvania you have to be very low income and have a kid, be very low income and have a disability and be pregnant and have some other reason why Pennsylvania thinks okay we'll give you health insurance. So when we talk about just opening up Medicaid on a straight income basis, this was how the majority of people who are going to get access to health care from the new market, from the law, were going to get it. Mm -hmm. What happened then was that the Supreme Court ruled this Medicaid expansion piece is actually optional for states. So they took it and they separated away from the rest of the law, which means that for everybody making less than 100% of the federal poverty line, there's no help available for them in this law. Come January 1st, people making up to $92,000 a year will get a tax credit to purchase private health insurance, but a home health aide making $11,000 a year, there's going to be no help for her. Meanwhile, states like New Jersey, Ohio, states all around us, states with other Republican governors, are moving forward and doing this because not only is it the right thing to do, but it's the smart thing to do. Pennsylvania would bring in about forty-some billion dollars in order to cover these people. So basically what we're saying is, oh, no thank you, federal government. We don't want all of this money to give health care coverage to these folks, and we're sending it back instead. Not only would we create, um, not only would we be able to give coverage and we would bring in these funds, we would save taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars to over a billion dollars um, in uncompensated care costs. We would create about 35,000 jobs. I mean, I can go on and on and I'll stop, but basically... And that's what going. the law was designed it's, to it's do. These really are exactly the deal. people that the law was designed to, to benefit. Right. And we have a, you know, our Governor Corbett standing in the way of... of and they're cutting them out. Benefit. And a lot of them are women. 
Yes, uh, 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 actually a majority of them are right. women. The other so. thing that's really important to understand about these people, and there's about 400,000 of them that make less than 100% of federal poverty line who are gonna be left with no options for coverage. It's really important to understand is that the majority of them are working. 75% of these yep. folks have mm -hmm. at least one full-time worker in the household. And they're working jobs like auto mechanics, servers, home health aides, child care workers, they're working jobs that don't give benefits and also don't pay enough to buy health insurance in the private right. marketplace. They right. don't make um, so little that they qualify for Medicaid, but they don't make enough to actually be able to afford insurance, uh, you know, private insurance. Which so, was the which problem exactly, anyway. <laughs> exactly. Right. And the jobs that they're doing are physical and, you know, a lot of times dangerous or things that, you know, people that really need health insurance. And yeah. preventive care, the whole idea behind preventive care is to prevent chronic care, which is, mm -hmm. you know, what, what taxes uh, emergency rooms and, and taxpayers. Absolutely, and so if you'll afford me this pitch, we would Absolutely. like for folks, oh. we would love it if individuals would call their legislators, both their state legislator, their state senator, and also Governor Corbett and tell them to expand Medicaid now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that, you know, the tax credits are great for people that have, but again, those are people who make up to $92,000 for a family of four. Right. You know, the person that really needs it is the, you know, is the person that's just barely making ends meet. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I want to thank everybody. I mean, this has been, this has been amazing. Anything else that anyone like would like to add? How can we get in touch with you? Anybody? How do we? How do we? Uh, uh, Pennsylvania get with now, now is uh, has a website. It's uh, panow.org. Mm -hmm. So that's and, uh, the best way to, to get in touch with us. It, to, if someone wanted to, to become involved, what would oh, that you entail? Can, you can. Um, we have. We are a membership organization, so you can join um, online, and we are active. In all, you know, all the areas that I that I talked about, economic mm -hmm. justice, reproductive justice, etc. But we also have a PAC, so um, which is a political action committee. So uh, we are involved in elections and trying to get um, feminist uh, candidates into office, mm -hmm. people who are more, um, you know, sensitive to the needs um, of women and their families. Great. So. Philadelphia Fight, I guess you could just come to the LAC Center at 13th and Locust? You can. You can also go to uh, www.fight.org and, and see all about our, our fantastic organization or come to 13th and Locust and hit us up on the third floor or the fifth floor or the second floor and pretty much the whole building us. almost. Yep. <laughs> and Athena, Pennsylvania Health Access Network, how do we get there? Yeah, it's pahealthaccess.org. Folks can also follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. And we encourage you to sign up for our emails so you can hear about those important times to call the legislator and, and get good information. Well, this has been really enlightening. And uh, three organizations that serve vital functions in various aspects of healthcare. So let's help spread the word. Uh, thanks for talking with us, Athena, Angela, Karen, and thank you for watching. For GPS, I'm Jackie Doyle. And, uh, and for Philly Cam, like to say, have a great night. And you know, if you want to get in, in touch uh, and become involved with PhillyCam, it's phillycam.org. And uh, we'll see. Okay. Is that it? Don't move. Do, do, do the whole intro? Yeah. Up Either into what? Yourself, okay. Shout, okay. Everybody sit, stay still. We'll do okay. that six camera We need the entire intro. Okay.
Hello, and welcome to Go Philly Service, or GPS as it's known, which is certainly appropriate since our purpose is to direct you toward research resources available here in Philadelphia. I'm Jackie Doyle, and tonight we cap off eight hours of live programming in celebration of Philly Camp's fourth anniversary. Our focus today is on healthcare, certainly a hot button issue in so many ways, and my guests are all involved with local groups that provide services 